So we've heard a lot about actual impacts of research now, and I'm going to come and pose a lot of big questions rather than tell you what I've, uh, what I've achieved. Um, oh, that's... There we go. Um, such as, can diesel generators be green? It's probably quite a bold and brave question to ask. Um, probably not one you're used to hearing, perhaps, and it's certainly not one that I'm going to answer today. Uh, but hopefully in two and a half years' time, when I finish my NGD, I'll be able to answer it for you. Diesel generators and renewable energy might not seem like natural partners in crime, but actually diesel generators could have a, a real key role to play in the move to a low-carbon electricity supply. But we can't quantify the impacts that, the, that we have at the moment, and that really is where my research comes in. But before I tell you about what impacts they could have and how I'm going to quantify it, um, I'm just going to take a little bit of a step back and explain what a smart grid is, what it might look like, and what on earth I mean by a standby generator. So a smart grid is not a particularly well-defined term um, in any arena that I've, I've spoken about smart grids in. And that talk, this talk today is not going to change that. But loosely speaking, a smart grid is the term used to describe what the electricity grid of the future will look like. And that electricity grid of the future is going to be different. <laughs> it's going to have electric vehicles, potentially on a really large scale. It's going to have a lot of intermittent renewable energy. It's going to have a lot of interconnectors from between all sorts of countries and different markets interacting with each other, different system operators interacting with each other. But a lot of sectors seem to think that the smart grid is a big, shiny, fancy, new piece of technology. And that's really exciting, and people bring out all of these things that might happen, and it always reminds me of, of Futurama, which is why I've, I've put this up. But being smart isn't just about being new or doing new things. It's about doing what we already do better. And that's really where my project comes in. So dare I say it, that kind of means we might have to change the way we use electricity. So before you all reach for your phones and your chargers and your tablets and cling on to them, I'm not saying no. This project is not about saying no, and neither is the smart grid. Um, it's not about me saying I'm going to come into your home and change when your fridge is on, which is what a lot of people say to me when I say I'm doing smart grids. But it's about managing demand, and managing demand just means that we want to be able to use all the renewable energy we can when we've got it, like Marek was talking about earlier, but we want to be able to minimise our demand when there isn't a lot. On, okay? And so really it's just about changing our thoughts about electricity. But a lot of people think that all of this smart grid demand management is all going to be about interfering with your home, your domestic e electricity use, and we don't like the idea of that. But what we actually need to think about is that there are a lot of non-domestic users of electricity, like this building, and offices, and shops, and hospitals, and schools, and they are a huge user of, of electricity. And they have a real role to play in this demand management that is often um, skipped over on the policy, political side of things because people talk about home energy prices and home, home electricity use. But really there's a big difference between home electricity users, domestic users, and non-domestic users. And the main one, apologies for the repeated image, <laughs> um, but the main one is that as a domestic user, we don't think about this guy. When we switch the plug on, we don't have any kind of concept of, of how that's got to us or how difficult it was to get that electricity to us. And non-domestic users aren't all of a sudden all fantastically aware of where their electricity comes from, but they're actually given really key pricing indicators as to whether that electricity has been difficult to get to them or not, because it's more expensive when it's difficult to get to them on, for, for large electricity users. And this idea of peak electricity use isn't something that many of us as domestic users will be that aware of. Um, we are quite aware of peak for trains. We're quite aware of peak for phones, um, uh, particularly the early days of uh, mobiles. It was all about waiting till after six o'clock to make that vital phone call, so it was cheaper. But we've not really got that with electricity, although some of you will have heard of or even used Economy 7 and tariffs like that. But for non-domestic users, and large users of electricity. Um, peak pricing is compulsory. There is no kind of opt-in or opt-out. And so that makes them a really important kind of user group to, uh, to be looking at for demand-side management. So now we'll get on to my actual project and what on earth I mean by these standby generators. 
when I talk to people about diesel, they assume I'm going into a motor industry job. Um, but actually, diesel's used up and down the country in, I usually call them black boxes, but this one's yellow, so I'll have to stick with mm. yellow boxes. Um, and they exist up and down the country in all of those non-domestic buildings I was talking about. Not so much in schools, but in big offices, in telecoms industries, in, in retail shops. Why are they there? In case of a power cut. These big shops need to carry on selling. On a more vital note, hospitals must carry on saving lives when there is no power from the grid. So these standby generators are there in case of a power cut. But there aren't that many power cuts in the UK market now. And this is where someone will put their hand up and say, well, I had one last week. Uh, it happens every time I talk. But on, on, a, on as a whole, we don't have that many power cuts anymore. So these standby generators are sat there, up and down the country, hundreds, thousands, loads of these generators. And they're barely ever used. They're the most commonly, commonly installed form of distributed generation in the whole country, in the whole world. But when we talk about distributed generation for smart grids, we only talk about renewables, really. So what does this mean? What will my, what will my project outputs be in two and a half years' time, or aim to be? Well, the idea is to quantify how many of these generators might actually be out there. Uh, I'm sponsored by Marks and Spencer, um, so I have access to the data on those stores, but they're just a, such a, a tiny percentage of all of the generators out there. The big thing that I'm aiming to do is quantify the emissions impacts of these generators. Yes, emitting diesel, local diesel um, using diesel generators locally emits carbon, but can it be used in a better way at peak times of stress in conjunction with the wind ramping that Marek was talking about? Can they actually have a positive impact in the move towards a low carbon generation? So just to conclude, I'll, I'll leave a, almost a, a piece of homework for you. <laughs> when we're looking at the smart grids, we must not forget diesel generators. Thank you very much.